Seth Klaman is a legendary value investor with some $25 billion in assets under management at his Baupost Group. In 1991, he released a book called Margin of Safety, Risk Averse Value Investing Strategies for the Thoughtful Investor, which has become something of a must-read among sophisticated investors. Unfortunately, it is out of print, and a physical copy costs $2,000 to get from Amazon. One can only speculate of why Mr. Klarman decided not to make a second edition. There's clearly demand for it these days. Is it because he's already wealthy enough so he just don't care? Is it because he offended some group of people that doesn't like being offended? Or is it because he thought that maybe he revealed a little too much of his investing secrets? I don't know. But I had to get a copy myself in order to bring you guys this top 5 takeaway summary. Let's dive in. This is The Swedish Investor, bringing you the best tips and tools for reaching financial freedom through stock market investing. Takeaway number one. What's the difference between a value investor and a speculator? Seth Klarman is clearly influenced by Warren Buffett and Benjamin Graham. He even chose to name his book from Graham's concept, The Margin of Safety. As such, he is a value investor down to the core. What does it mean to be a value investor according to Klarman? Well, Klarman seems to divide investors into two camps, value investors and speculators. Not unlike what Buffett does, by the way. His right-hand man, Charlie Munger, may have said it best. I don't think the value investing will ever go out of style. Who in the hell doesn't want value when you buy something? How can there be anything else that makes any sense except value investing? What's the most important difference between these two groups, according to Klarman? It's that value investors focus on business cash flows, while speculators focus on the value in the resale market. Value investors buy securities when they seem to offer good returns for the risk incurred, and sell when this is no longer true. Speculators, on the other hand, only buy or sell when they think that the price of securities will rise or fall. Their ideas about future price movements are based on what they think that others will be doing. Now, a clever man would put the poison into his own goblet because he would know that only a great fool would reach for what he was given. I'm not a great fool, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of you. But you must have known I was not a great fool. You would have counted on it, so I can clearly not choose the wine in front of me. Why is it so stupid to make judgment calls based on price alone? Because it is never clear which future events that are already priced in at today's levels. Therefore, value investors always compare price to underlying business value. Art, antiques, rare coins, Pokemon cards, cryptos, these things are not investments, but pure speculation, simply because they do not produce anything valuable to other people, and so they do not produce any cash. The only time they may throw off cash is when you sell them. And the problem is that the buyer must also think that he'll eventually be able to sell the asset to someone else at an even higher price. Otherwise, he wouldn't want to buy, right? Machines make stuff that people want. Buildings pay rent. Subscription software creates recurring revenues. Loans issued pay interest. These are the things for value investors. If these cash flows can be purchased at a reasonable price relative to their potential of growing in the future, and most importantly, the risk that they might disappear in the future, Seth Klarman is an interested buyer. That's what's up next. Takeaway number two. Investment risk. A terribly misunderstood concept. You've probably heard that Warren Buffett's first rule of investing is to never lose money and that his second rule is to never forget rule number one. This does not mean that you should never have a down year in the stock market though. Trying to guard yourself against that is impossible. It does mean that, over several years, you should invest in a way that ensures that you'll never experience any material losses. Value investors like Klarman and Buffett are incredibly focused on this downside, on investment risk. Why are they so obsessed with it? Because in investing, simply put, if you can remove the downside, the upside will take care of itself. Risk for a value investor boils down to two things. The nature of the asset that you are purchasing, which determines the degree of cash flow certainty, 
and the price that you are paying for it. The cash flows from a company with a long history in a slow changing industry, like McDonald's for example, are very low risk. So McDonald's fulfills the first criteria for a low risk investment. However, it does sell at a PE of 32 or EV EBIT 25 currently, and that is not exactly cheap. You can still lose money here if that PE multiple were to go down to, say, 18. So it's always a two part equation. Investment risk is a terribly misunderstood concept. Klaman takes a major stab at professors teaching finance to think that beta, or price volatility, is the main determinant of investment risk. This misconception has spread like a plague, even to some professionals on Wall Street. Beta is a terrible measurement of risk, because it fails to take the nature of the asset and its price into account. Perhaps the worst manifestation of all this nonsense is the Capital Asset Pricing Model, or CAPM, which states that greater returns will be achieved by those who are willing to accept greater risks. They got it completely back asswards. To the contrary, risk erodes returns by causing losses. For instance, small cap stocks are often said to yield higher returns than large caps because they are riskier. But if a higher return is a given, are they really that risky? No, price volatility isn't a good predictor of future performance. <laughs> Heck, it is not even that good of a predictor of future volatility, says Klaman. Takeaway number three. Three methods of valuing a stock. A value investor does not wake up in the morning knowing his buy and sell orders for sure. These will always be determined depending on the relationship between value and price. While price is easy to see, just log on to Yahoo Finance and check where it's at. How do you determine the value side of this equation? Klaman has three different methods that he suggests. Liquidation or breakup value. A simple way of valuing a company is to look at its balance sheet and see what the value of all of its assets are. If you sum up all the assets and deduct all the liabilities, you'd get a theoretical value if the company was to liquidate. Most profitable businesses aren't interested in shutting down though, and most of their value does not come from the balance sheet, but rather from their income and cash flow statements. However, Liquidation value can still represent some sort of floor or cushion, especially if these assets consist of tangible liquid stuff like cash or marketable securities. Sometimes even a profitable business sells for less than the net value of such assets, and that could be an interesting investment opportunity. Stock market value. Another simple way of valuing a company is by looking at its earnings and cash flow and see how they trade in relation to other similar securities in the market. For example, if semiconductor manufacturer A is valued at PE20 while the industry average is PE30, you might argue that A has a 50% upside just in multiple expansion. Klaman thinks one must be very careful with this approach though. The market could be wrong on a whole industry just like it could be wrong on a single company. However, in something like a spin-off situation, when a company is going to list one of its subsidiaries, this approach is the most appropriate one. Discounted cash flow analysis or DCF. If you sum up the cash flows of an investment from today until judgment day and you use a proper discount rate, you'll get its theoretical value. This approach works best for a business with strong prospects. You must be able to say something about its future with some degree of certainty, because the calculations are very sensitive to assumptions about growth rates, etc. The method is theoretically correct for any type of investment, but one must be careful as there's a high risk of garbage in, garbage out. At times, a combination of different valuation methods gives the best result especially with widely diversified businesses, such as Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. However you choose to combine them, the main point is this. Any time you come up with a value which is quite a bit higher than the security's current price, you've got a margin of safety. When investing, you must insist on a margin of safety. Why? 
Consider this. A real estate agent cannot appraise the value of your home to the nearest $10,000. Therefore, it isn't reasonable to expect something more complicated, like business valuation, to be a very precise science either. Takeaway number four. To hold or not to hold. Cash. If you've been watching this channel for some time, you probably know that I think opportunity costs may be the most important concept that investors must learn about. If you put your money in stock A, you cannot allocate those same resources to stock B. In fact, you cannot allocate the money to stock C, D, E, F, G or H either. And that's really tough when B, C, D, E, F, G or H overperform your own choice, which was A. So <laughs> choose well. Seth Klarman discusses another dimension of opportunity costs in investing. Have you ever sat through a huge market dip, wishing that you had some cash on hand? I sure have. And that represents an opportunity cost too. By being fully invested all the time, you forgo the opportunity of investing a ton of cash at a market bottom. The choice of being fully invested or partly in cash is complex. And Klaman's advice on this matter is really refreshing. Because there is a middle road. Imagine that you've found a company with a 10% dividend yield. You buy it and then the market crash by 50%. You think, damn, I should have stayed in cash. But then you remember, you still have your dividend. Within a year, you'll get 10% of your original investment back in dividends, which could be reinvested in the cheap market. Not so bad, after all. A high dividend company isn't even the best in class, by the way. We talked about valuing a company based on the liquidation of assets earlier. Such companies can throw off tons of cash at just the right moment, if a market turn is around the corner. The same goes for something like a merger arbitrage opportunity. You'll get your invested capital back really soon, and you are ready to redeploy it at that point. This is the general idea. If you think that the market is in for a crash, it's oftentimes a bad idea to act on it by sitting on cash. More often than not, you'll be getting out of the market while all your friends stay and get rich. Money itself isn't lost or made, it's simply uh, transferred from one perception to another. Like magic. What you can do instead is choose to invest in situations where lots of your invested cash should be returned in the near future by investing in, for example, high dividend payers, liquidations, or merger arbitrages. That way, you are not sitting on the sidelines, and you'll be ready with cash if that collapse that you are expecting really is coming. Awesome! Takeaway number 5. Apply the 80-20 approach. Do you know someone who would gladly wait half a day outside of Walmart on Black Friday just to get a $100 discount on their TV? Perhaps the same person who does weeks of research before buying something like a new washing machine. But then, when it comes to his $10,000 investment in TSMC, that decision was made on a whim. I hope it is obvious that you don't want to be this person. However, you also don't want to be the person who spends weeks researching a single stock just to miss the opportunity. Seth Klarman suggests something of an 80-20 approach towards investing in the stock market. It's better to spend most of your time shuffling through many opportunities than to go really deep on any of them. Otherwise, you'll become like old Bilbo Baggins. I don't know half of you half as well as I should like, and I like less than half of you half as well as you deserve. Oftentimes, the really great ideas don't require that much of research anyways. They should be what some call a screaming buy. They got that margin of safety, and it is quite obvious if you just spotted them at the right moment. You'll have to turn many stones, but don't think that those opportunities that you shut down is wasted time. One of the wonderful benefits with investing is that all knowledge is cumulative. Yesterday's insights could be useful sooner than you think. So, focus on cash flows rather than resale price. Investment risk is a combination of cash flow certainty and price. You can value a stock by using either the liquidation, market value or DCF method. If you find the market expensive, 
make sure that cash flows arrive earlier. And a lot of your time as an investor should be spent shuffling through many ideas. Next, why don't you check out how the father of value investing, Benjamin Graham, made his first $1 million? Cheers, guys. <laughs>